Humor haunts and homicide. How you doing? Welcome to Humor Haunts and Homicide. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so glad to have everybody back. Episode five. Did you miss us? Of course they we did. We missed you. We so missed you. Our best friends. Friends of bestes. <laughs> Thank you for joining us again. We're here today to give you a couple different, you know, tidbits of updates and what's new and all things us for yeah. you. So why don't we just like jump right in? Yes, and just jump. Jump, jump, jump on in. Jump, and jump around. Uh, what's going on with you? You have exciting news. Exciting news, yeah. Um, it's kind of crazy. So I did a little soul searching and uh, there was some medical things that allowed me to take some a couple weeks off of work. So I really was able to kind of spend some time and focus on my family, my mental health, my well-being. And Our podcast. Our podcast <laughs> that allowed us to be able to really focus the time for me to be able to launch and really find out what I wanted to do next in my life. And I needed a hobby and, and I something I enjoyed. And for me, this was kind of like a mix of all of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if you've checked out like our, our website, especially it was is literally 100 percent his little baby. I had, no, no, I had nothing baby. to do with that. Rocked it back and forth. I gave it like a little Tamagotchi treatment. I mean, um you really kind of did it all. I'm not going to lie. You, uh, I mean, I'm not saying I didn't have input, but I mean, you created the logo, launched the website. It was great. Kinda, it was yeah. Great. It I was mean, fun. It, it, I told myself I wanted to try something new and learn it. And you too is great for teaching yourself shit. You didn't think you could do. So for all of you out there that want to build a website and do a podcast, it can be done. You don't have to know how you're doing it. Yeah, just, just do a little research. Trial, trial and error. Trial and, and error. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, it's been fun. It's been great. But anyway, so back to the, back to, news. Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> getting off topic there. Uh, exciting news. So yeah, I, I actually have, uh, two different job offers. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm You're like a hot commodity. <laughs> <laughs> Two job offers and trying to figure out which one to take. There's a lot of pros and cons, you know, and actually not really any cons really, but pros for different reasons on the spectrums and money. There, there's a, a, a little gap in money from each job. Uh, one's much higher than the other, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily a huge factor for me, but you know, it's been great. It's been a little stressful, but in a good way. Well, good. and it's good because you're kind of in a position where you're, you really are going to be able to make um, an informed decision. I feel on like which one yes. is, is going to be right for you. So yes. yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. It's a good time to be able to really figure out what's next for go best friend. For me. Best friend. Thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate the support there. I really do. But you know what I really like talking about because I've had a lot of time to really watch some shows but I really haven't been spending a lot of time on TV, truthfully, as much as I thought I would. I wanted to watch all Game of Thrones. I, I've got almost there. Yeah, you're close. I've got almost there. Uh, it's been like three or four months since I've been starting it. I'm on I'm almost the end of season six, episode nine. And man. I will say this week or like the last few days. I don't Ooh. know if it's that you've watched a lot or maybe just like those particular episodes have had a lot going on because I've been getting like updates you know when things happen which has been really <laughs> i will tell you it like breaks up the monotony at, like at work and stuff when all of a sudden i get a, a text message with john snow in all caps you know like or oh my god you know this happened blah blah blah. i don't know how do people <laughs> handle these emotions seriously how did you guys all do this together i mean i guess that's how you got through it get each other as fans in a little fan call well i kind of came into it late um, I think I came into it when maybe season six was the current season. Oh. So I actually had to binge like the, I did binge like the first five really quick. And then like, I was able to get where I was current, but okay. anyway. Well, for those of you <laughs> that have not gotten a game of Thrones, spoiler alert, because I failed to do that last time. No, I, and then I know, I, I know, I know it's just me. Probably. You do not need to do a spoiler alert. Th at this there point. are people like me okay. <laughs> that I'm sure are out there that have not watched it, that maybe want to one day. And I'm sorry. I fucked that up for you. Last episode. Here we are. Me redeeming myself. Okay. Wow. But 
Uh, gosh, how do I even pack what I meant? So we found out how the Night King became a Night King. A little more into, is it Bran? Is that his name? Branson? Yeah. Brandon? What, you mean like the, the young? The, the non-walking. Yeah, kid. that's Bran. Stark. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I don't really still understand his tree thing, the, the raven. I don't really understand that. You know, I don't either, <laughs> to okay. be honest. Okay. I mean, I do, but I don't. And I will say that that show is... It's one of those shows where so many things are going on. Yeah. Uh, it's, I only watch it the one time. Like I really could do a rewatch. I could do well with a rewatch. And you watched it live as the finale was going on. Yeah. Like okay. maybe like season six and seven and eight, there's eight seasons, right? Yes. I think those three, I actually watch live. Okay. Um, like as they were happening. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a long time and now you've gotten me kind of like where I, I'm excited Get, to kind of jump back in. I might me. do it. I might do it. Just you jump know? It so that we can <laughs> talk and you can kind of like refresh the feelings and maybe you can answer questions for me. Well, I mean, yeah, that would be awesome. I mean, I'm obviously like I remember big stuff and, um, but like, um, Daenerys just walked through fire after she set all the Dothraki on fire. That was great. And she was naked. again. She was totally naked. She loves fucking she being naked. She loves her tits out. She <laughs> loves them tits to be aired out, man. They gotta be sweaty. Cause she's constantly needing them to be aired. You know, but I, love Daenerys. I mean, she's one of my favorites, I think. I, I don't know. I mean, she's like bad, but like good. I mean, the, how can you beat dragons? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And she's awesome. just like a badass bitch. And then there's Oleana. Was that her name? Ole, Oleana? Ole, yes, the grandma. The grandma. Oh, God, I love dude, her. I, she's a, love her she's so an much. OG, she's an OG bad bitch. Brianna Tarth. Love her so much. I think she's my favorite character. God, I love her. She's like the slayer of all great characters that need to die. Uh, Love her. And then uh, who else do I love? I don't know if there's many others. Marjorie. I do love Marjorie. I do love her. She's great. And then her brother, poor him. I do love him too, but he's not really like a main character. He's kind of like whatever. Uh, And who's the guy with the bald one? Valis? More Ballas, Ballas. Oh yes, the one without the nuts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's like e- a eunuch. Is that what you eunuch, call it? Yes. A eunuch or whatever. Yeah, love me some him. Yeah, he's he's cool. great. And Tyrion, love Tyrion. You gotta love oh, Tyrion. Oh my god, I love Tyrion. God, I love Lannister. me some Tyrion. And even yeah. um, not Cersei though. Fuck that bitch, <laughs> Miss Sandy. I like her. She's not really like a. She doesn't really talk a lot, but she's cool. And then um, the other eunuch, that's her boyfriend. I don't even know his name. Oh, the soldier guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's cool. You know, yeah. and he almost died. I, I almost. Felt sad. I did feel sad. Yeah. But not like in a main character sad. You Great know? show though. Oh, yeah. Great show. Great, Great show. Yeah. I also heard that you took my advice and started watching, or you did watch mm-hmm. um, American Nightmare. I it? did. You inspired me and then I finished it. Okay. And where'd you leave off? <laughs> <what's>, I, <laughs> I'm in the same place as I was last week. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um. So I'm gonna need to. You know what? I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna commit to watch that tonight for you. I think I'm only like about thirty minutes to the end to the complete. Oh, day. okay. There really so, isn't a whole lot that you don't know though. I think I know most of it. Yeah. Yeah. But there, anyway, there yeah. A, so I won't say anything else about it. But if you haven't seen American Nightmare on Netflix, uh, we don't endorse this shit, but watch it. Yeah, we definitely won't spoil that one. That one's still new, so yeah. we won't do spoil. I, on the other hand, have been like super into um, Queer Eye this week. Okay, so you're not watching the traders yet. I'll forgive it, but I no, like the I haven't queer eye. Started. I love. Okay, so Jonathan Van Ness is one of my favorite people on the planet. So uh-huh. um, anyway, that's so I I watch the show mostly for him, but I love them all. <laughs> okay, I mean, I honestly haven't really watched a lot of it. I'm I know, in my ally era. Oh, go you, you. <laughs> Renee Swift, you. <laughs> They need to all calm down. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've also been um, delving in right now. Okay, so I have a, a pretty long commute to work. So I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, and I also just recently downloaded Audible. I'm currently reading this book, or I guess listening to, whatever, um, a book by Stephen King. Which one? It's called 11 um, and you know, it has it sounds to do, familiar, but I haven't read it. Okay, so I had um, seen a lot of people recommending it, so I just was like, "Let's go!" And it's really cool. There's time travel. Oh, um, basically, this guy. The, the premise, without like giving things away, is this guy is basically trying to travel back in time to potentially stop the assassination of president Kennedy because it's like, how would that have changed the trajectory of the world if he had never been assassinated? So um, I still, I mean, I think, man, it was like a, 
40 hour read or something. And I think I'm still, ha- I'm like halfway through. So, so is it more like a sci-fi read or is it more like, is there horror aspects to it? Cause he's known for like that horror element. Kind, so far, not yet. I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't consider it horror at okay. this point, but it's, it's so far it's really good. I really enjoy it. Oh. So anyway, I'm well, yeah. So send it to me. I will uh, keep everyone updated on, on the progress of that. But yeah, so far. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Well, when you get to the traders, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need you to do that. Yeah, okay, I'm going to need to do that. But if you don't I like probably it, should do that soon because The Masked Singer is coming soon. And you know that that'll take up. <laughs> it is. It's it my is. favorite show of all time. It is. So. Well, <laughs> get to it. All right. Love you. Thank you so much. Uh, what else do we have in store today? We have our Mad Lib cold read that we've been really enjoying putting together for you. Yeah. So we already picked our words and now we're just going to. Give you the read. Give you our little story. All right. Give it to me, Sissa. Okay. So this one is entitled Drag Dictionary. Okay. Drag mother. An older, more sexy queen who mentors a younger queen and teaches her the douchebags of the trade. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Hunty. A combination of the words honey and flim flammery. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> used as a prostitute of endearment. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Fishy <clears throat> describes a drag pimp who very bitterly resembles a gushy woman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the house down used to play an exclamation point in speech. Example, girl is tickling that look, the house down. <laughs> Kai Kai, the act of 13 drag butts having juicy relations with one another. (laughs) Sickening, amazing, succulent, hot, the best. Yes. Mm -hmm. Throwing shade, insulting or spitting criticism in a delicious way. (laughs) And last but not least, Tuck. To conceal one's elbow and toenails so as not to dance the illusion of femininity. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, that was like the, I think that made absolutely no sense. I mean, none of them do, but. No, that one had made no sense and, so far, and I love it. So, we, you, you know, know there that you go. One was the most nonsensible one we've done so far. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, my good. God. I love that. That's great stuff. Can't wait for next week. But well, moving right along into our new segment titled "What the Florida." What the Florida? Um, Josh actually has a personal "What the Florida" story for us today. I do, and you know, I don't know why I forgot about this. I guess you know there are many episodes that we will be doing, so I just didn't know the right time to tell it. But I will start from the beginning. So I used to live in a town which is beautiful and small and um, amazing. If you have never visited Dunedin, Florida, you have to. But I lived there for a few years. I was outside at the pool with some friends. And there was this weirdo that kind of circled our... We had, like, this community, and it was gated. And you could walk, like, a half mile around the entire complex. Okay. And he constantly did that. And you could see him, like, talking to himself constantly. So you didn't know what the fuck this guy was saying. But you knew that something wasn't right. Well, when you get a little drunk and you get a little beer courage in you you start to think that you're big and bad. So we're at the pool and I look over near the restroom area where he's sitting and it's like a little, um, had like four chairs on a table and he's just like intently staring me down, like creepily staring me down. And I Mm. hear him, what he's saying from across the pool. And there's probably like a 25 foot radius between us. I hear him say, fuck him up, cut him up, fuck him up, cut him up, fuck him up, cut him up over and over and over. And I looked to my ex who's with me with my friends and I said, is he going to, is he saying fuck him up, cut him up? I said, no, I'm going to fuck him up. So I'm going to act like I'm going to go over there and fight this motherfucker. And now granted, this is like, I don't know, eight years ago when I was young and drunk and, you're and stupid. An, you're an Aries. And I'm an Aries. <laughs> okay. So, you know, all those things together equal. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't, I shouldn't have done and said that. And luckily my friends and my ex talk sense into me and they're like, Josh, don't be stupid. You're drunk. You're dumb. You don't normally act like this. You don't want to go fight him. He's crazy and probably scary. Don't do anything about right. this. So I took their advice and I did not. And then here's where the fun takes place. And I say fun very hard, like lightheartedly, because this is an absolutely terrible story. But from where my apartment was, 
one day I was leaving work and I look out my front door and I see like three to four CSI vans at a kitty corner apartment. And yes, I say kitty corner. I know it's probably catty corner for most of you, but I'm from Michigan and that's what we do. So I say kitty corner. Okay. So I'm glad I'm okay. not. Every time I say that to my husband, he's like, it's catty. That's all. That's weird. Oh, well, maybe I feel like, oh. But he's also Southern, Southerner. So I mean, I'm Midwestern also. Right. So maybe, so maybe it's a <laughs> anyway. Midwestern thing. Anywho. <laughs> and I see all these CSI vans and I'm like instantly freaked out. Like, what the hell's going on? It's not just something that you see for a normal heart attack, you know? No, definitely not. So here's the story. Query quickly of Chris Horan and the murder of his sister. So Chris Horan, who was 39 years old, had lived with his sister. He was schizophrenic. She was taking care of him legally as a caretaker and guardian. And out of nowhere, one day they had some sort of argument. He ended up stabbing her in the skull, in the neck, in the chest. In the skull. Over 12 times. God. When he hit her with the knife in her skull the knife had bent and then um pretty much immediately after the murder he left to go buy a plane ticket to mexico but somehow ended up in georgia and no one's really sure why he was in macon which well, doesn't means, make sense i think that's mental definitely mental issues at that point so I then guess, i did a little wow. further digging because of course i wanted to know how i was almost murdered you know <laughs> i mean yeah. and uh he had a facebook and he drew a picture on like a piece of regular letter size printer paper. And it was on like he like a like a marker almost. It was blue. Right. And it looked like a 12 year old wrote it with their left hand with their right handed. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know how that looks mm -hmm. if you write with your right hand. Yes. And it was an airplane that was on fire. Him with like an arrow pointing to him that said me. Another one that was pointing to another stick figure that said Katy Perry loves me. And then it said equals death and then posted that on Facebook. And there was like a bunch of his friends that were like, oh. dude, are you, are you okay? And then he never responded. Oh, I wonder if like he would have done something like on the plane. If that's, I don't know, man. Like if he was going to get a plane ticket, I mean, again, who knows? I don't who know. Knows, but but... part of me wanted to tell the story because you think sometimes saying what you feel or speaking up for what you think is right is the right thing to do. This guy, if I pissed him off, I guarantee you. He could have done it to you. Absolutely. I he mean, saw me every day. I was walking my dogs alone several times, uh, you know, a week. He very much could have just got a knife and stabbed me as I was walking the corner or something mm. because he wanted to get me. I mean, imagine his sister who he loved and he want, he fucking murdered her. Right. Exactly. Oh, what, my God. What's he going to do to this guy he, that just pissed him off in this apartment complex? Mm. Goodbye, Josh Compton. Fuck him up, cut him up. Fuck him up, cut him up. <laughs> Fuck him up, cut him up. That's what he was going to do. So now, after Leanna Horan's death, his sister, um, they ended up finding that she was stabbed in the head over 20 times. And there were several knives that he used in order to try to do this because all the knives kept oh bending. Oh, God. What a... Terrible. And the police had said, and I quote, that this was a very bloody crime scene, pretty much the most gruesome crime scene they'd ever seen. The attack was so violent that the knives appeared to bend because he tried to stab her in the head when he did, and it caused it to bend. And then they also said that the murder happened around 7 p.m. this night. The sister and him, like I had stated earlier, got into an argument because he wanted to go out drinking, and she didn't want him to go because he shouldn't be. He's crazy. He's on medication for really? being schizophrenic, and he should not go out drinking. And he said that there was definitely a crime scene. There was no doubt about that. And that it was just an absolutely awful, awful murder. And Dunedin is not a place where this normally happens. No, you don't hear about No, definitely Extremely not. Extremely safe. Tons and tons of tourists a year. And it's extremely beautiful right on the water. I would love how the article says people at the complex were shocked to learn the news. That's the understatement. Of yeah. The <laughs> yeah. A little bit, you know, a little, little bit. bit, including the person that almost got murdered. by. Yeah. Him. So, all right. Well, I, wow. I'm glad. Yeah. I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy that you're here. Me too. So. <laughs> I'm absolutely happy to be here telling that story for you. Could have definitely been the alternative. So, yeah, wow. you know, if anything's learned, definitely watch your surroundings, be aware of who you see, and sometimes not saying anything is better and than saying something and your safety matters. So be careful. I think we're all thinking the same thing. And that's what the Florida. <laughs> what the Florida. 
And again, anywhere safe can happen to you. So. All right, great. So Josh, you're up. What story do you have for us this week? You ready? I'm ready. All right. Well, listeners, some of you may or may not have heard about this creepy ass town that is now abandoned called Centralia, Pennsylvania, but it is haunted as hell and it has a story to tell. Ready? You're a poet. I know, right? That was kind of right on the fly. It's kind of fun. All right, guys, ladies, gentlemen, deep in the heart of Pennsylvania lies a town with a chilling secret. Centralia, which is known for its eerie hauntings, this small and seemingly ordinary town has captivated the imaginations of locals and visitors alike. Brandishing a potent mix of ghostly tales and unexplainable phenomena, Centralia has earned its reputation as a literal hotbed of paranormal activity. So I'm going to kind of break this story up into segments because there's just a lot to talk about. And I don't want to have it all meddled in just with a bunch of information. So you kind of understand the pieces here. So I'll start with the history of Centralia. Centralia's story dates back to the 17th century when it was colonized by many Native American tribes. It was sold to colonial agents in 1749 But it was in 1770 that settlers surveyed and explored the land a little further. A large portion of the land in what is now Columbia County was used to create and was named Route 61. Route 61 was the main highway in and out of Centralia. In 1793, a Revolutionary War hero named Robert Morris acquired a third of Centralia's valley land. While the land acquisition was a huge win for the town and Robert himself at the time, The excitement didn't last very long because by 1798, Robert himself had gone bankrupt and the land was surrendered to the Bank of the United States. The land was later acquired by a French sea captain named Stephen Girard. He purchased the auction land for $30,000. Stephen learned after buying the land that the town had an abundance of anthracite coal and underground mines. At that time, the town was not called Centralia. It was actually named Bull's Head, being named after its town's first tavern opening. Oh, well, they like their taverns, I guess. (laughs) Love themselves their taverns. (laughs) Naming the, can you imagine like naming yourself after your Applebee's, like the town, (laughs) or like Beef O'Brady's? Applebee, Florida. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shit. Good stuff. But the town is called Bull's Head for only about the next 10 years. When then Alexander Ray, a mining engineer, moved his family into the town, began planning a village, and mapped out the streets and other lots for development. He later named the town Centerville, and it was around the year 1865 when the town received its final name Centralia. It was changed for that final time due to the U.S. Postal Service already having another town called Centerville in, and I don't know if I'm going to butcher this, Shukil? Shukil? Oh, it might, I mean, Shulkil? it might be like a, what if it has a K sound, like Skykill? I, I don't know. That, Sk- that county, okay. <laughs> <laughs> With all I the, can't help you on that one. I know. <laughs> wow. But that county, wherever that is, <laughs> there's a duplicate Centerville, which caused them to have to change their name to now Centralia, which at that time was then the bustling coal mine that it was. I like Centralia better. Isn't that fancy? Like Centralia. It just kind of gives like, it an extra hmm, zing. It's bougie, kind of. bougie. It's not going to end up bougie, but, you know. No. (laughs) But because of the bustling coal mining town that it was, the abundance of anthracite coal eventually just attracted almost everyone. Settlers, industrialists, anyone you can think of that wanted to make a money buck quickly off of the establishment here in Centralia back in 1866. Then it was Centralia, and it was incorporated as a borough in 1866. Its principal employer was the anthracite coal industry, And then Alexander Ray, the town's founder, was eventually murdered in a buggy by members of the Molly Maguire's gang on October 17th, 1868, during a trip between Centralia and Mount Carmel. Three men were eventually convicted of the death, and then they were hung in the county seat of Bloomsburg on March 25th, 1878. Poor Alexander. Yeah, terrible. But it seems to always happen with people in power. Yeah, especially back then. Like, the 1800s were a wild time. Yeah. A wild time. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. But several other murders and incidences of arson also took place during an uptick in violence, which also was following the murder of Alexander Ray. 
So it basically started an uproar and a riot in the town. Yeah. So these, the Molly Maguire, um, they were up to no good, it sounds like. They were a terrible, <laughs> terrible gang. And Centralia was actually a hotbed of activity for them in the 1860s. And it was to organize mine workers as a union in order to improve the working conditions and economical wages. So they claimed that they were there to do good, but anyone that's a gang knows mm, that it's not it's really not, good intention. No, no, it's behind no. what you're trying to do. They sure aren't. <laughs> but by 1877, many of the gang members were eventually found and they were hung due to the crimes which surrounded much of the town's violence that they created. Legend has it that those gang members eventually lived there until about 1980. Mm -hmm. So their family members had wow. just kind of been passed down and still kind of stayed in the crime family, biz, which was sad, but that ended by the 80s. Mm -hmm. Then, according to the Census Bureau, Centralia had reached a peak population of 2,761 people and around 1890. The town at that time had seven churches, five hotels, 27 saloons, two theaters, a bank, a post office, 14 stores, which totally made up a mix of general and grocery and different labor stores. The town at this point was thriving for several decades with coal mining still becoming the backbone of the economy. That is until around roughly 37 years later when the production of anthracite coal has reached its peak in Pennsylvania. Much of the reason is due to many of the mine workers being enlisted to serve in the military in the U.S. when they entered World War One. Oh, so there was no one to, like, man the mines. Nobody. Okay. And that basically left the children and women at home and yeah. left robbers there to be able to pick the mines dry, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Then, in 1929, the Wall Street crash had caused the town to close five of its local mines. By 1950, the population of Centralia had started to show steady declines. The population is now 1,986 people, and most of the town's coal companies have shut itself down. When the mines closed, this brought back the crime that people had called pillar robbing. Pillar mining, or robbing, both called the same thing, is the act of unauthorized robbery of local coal from mines. And the bootleg miners eventually picked the mines so clean that many of the mines began collapsing due to the mines' pillars being diminished. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. The bootleg mining continued until around 1982, and then it stopped. So now we'll kind of talk a little bit more about the fires around Centralia and what that mining issue had led to this future problem. Okay. So please hold. It was then in 1947 that the town saw its first mining tragedy, on March 25th, 1947, coal mine number five, is what it's referred to, explodes near Centralia, injuring 31, killing 111. The mine's explosion was due to the buildup of coal powder in the mine, struck by the friction of falling debris, and many of the legends are told around the town's haunted activity and say that it's revolving around the 111 deaths that occurred in the coal mine on that terrible day. I mean, that's a lot in like one day and especially because the population you know at that time is less than 2000 yeah. so you lose a, 111 people at one time like that's that is definitely a tragedy yeah it definitely hits the town hard especially when you're that close knit of a community yeah you tend like a, to, a small town is gonna feel something like that yeah more, you, you tend know? to feel that a little closer to home well not just that struck, though, as an extra tragedy, a second coal mine fire is what eventually led to the town's downfall. It was in 1962 when the disaster struck Centralia, then a coal mine when it fire ignited beneath the town. The fire started in an abandoned coal mine, and then it quickly spread to the vast network of underground tunnels and shafts, which, again, were full of anthracite coal. Efforts to extinguish the fire proved futile, and the fumes continued to rage underground, releasing toxic gases into the air, creeping through the cracks of the sidewalk that eventually broke due to the heat that seeped through the pores of the city. The cause of the fire is not really agreed upon by everybody, but this is the main popular theory, which stems from May 27, 1962. <clears throat> the Centralia Borough Council hired a volunteer company which was a fire company to clean up the town's landfills, hoping that this would eventually help with the fires not spreading. But it was the abandoned strip mine pit next to the Odd Fellow Cemetery just outside the borough limits that eventually caused this to spread. 
it was done as far as the annual cleanup. They tried to do it after Memorial Day. And that was where it's done in prior years. And this time it was done in a different location because they said that they wanted to properly extinguish the landfill fire, which led to the fire falling into the mine pit from an unsealed opening. Mm, I can see that. Okay. So that's the popular working theory is that there was a huge opening due to these cracks. They were working on the landfills and they were trying to do the burning to control all the trash. And it seeped through the bottom of those cracks. Mm which seeped through these coals, which kept on fire. And as we know, coal beams very easily, which caused the fire to spread, which eventually spread several miles throughout the underground mines of the town. Yeah. Well then, speaking of tragedy, another theory claims that the fire had started the previous day when that trash hauler dumped ash and coal discarded from coal burners in the open trash pit. So, not only do they think that happened, but they think that some mysterious trash truck came secretively and was like trying to clean up but didn't say anything so those ninja those ninja trash trucks you know <laughs> people just theorize shit that they think so that was in their minds another tragedy okay but another author you know several people report on this but this author in particular um made a book called the day of the earth caving in i said that completely wrong the day the earth caved in close. it was close mm -hmm. They noted that the borough council minutes from June 4th, 1962 referred to two fires at the dump and five firefighters had submitted bills for fighting the fire at the landfill area. The borough by law was responsible for installing a fire resistant clay barrier between each layer of the landfill, but they fell behind schedule due to staffing problems, leaving the barrier incomplete. This allowed the hot coals to penetrate through the coal seam underneath the pit and started the subsequent subterrain fire. Regardless of any theory you think, the fire eventually spread and the effects of the incident will be felt for eternity. So regardless of how it happened, it's burning. Completely. <laughs> Forever. I mean, they, they think it could be happening for several hundred years. It's crazy. Completely crazy. <laughs> In 1979, town locals became aware that there was a problem when then the mayor, John Coddington, inserted a dipstick into one of the underground fuel tanks to check the levels. And then when he pulled the dipstick out, it seemed extremely hot. He then put the thermometer into the tank and was shocked to see that the thermometer read 172 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot. Correct. <laughs> extremely hot as Hades. <laughs> By 1981, the statewide attention kind of started to get put on Centralia due to the mine fires that were steadily increasing. It was on February 14, 1981, when a 12-year-old boy named Todd Dombrowski fell into a 4-foot-wide, 150-foot-deep sinkhole that opened up in his grandma's backyard. Now, Ooh. what do you think happened next? I mean, I don't know. Tell me. Okay. <laughs> Miraculously, the boy was able to grab onto a tree root, and his nearby cousin that saw him falling was able to pull him to safety. The hot steam was plummeting through the sinkhole, and it had brought attention of U.S. Representative James Nelligan and Governor Dick Thurnber to the town to assess the area. So, at that time, you don't just have representatives traveling to these places. No, that's terrifying, though. Getting, oh, man, getting sucked up by a sinkhole. Um, and, and, and living. I, Go cousin, you know. For real. Cousin Eric, man. He was able to pull that shit off. Now, although there were physical evidence of the fire's impacts all over the town, the residents of Centralia were extremely frustrated and they were divided over whether the fires had a direct threat on the life of the town's people and the longevity of their health throughout the town. There were several of interpretations by community groups on what exactly happened and how the town can move forward, but ultimately the government got involved. And in 1983, the U.S. Congress had budgeted more than $42 million for relocation efforts for all of the residents in Centralia. By the end of 1990, the census had shown that only around 63 residents still remained. And then it was in 1992 that Pennsylvania Governor Bob Casey invoked eminent domain in all the property in the city and condemned all the properties within city limits. So this town goes from like 2,700 people at its height to now we're at 63, 63, 63 people that, so obviously they deemed it not safe. They deemed for, it extremely not safe. Yeah, which for, I mean, for the government to get involved. Well, I mean, a town is 
burning without stopping. Um, and there's still people that's that are like, no for me, you know? it's my home. I'm never leaving my home. Can't yeah. do it. Won't do it. Can't make me. Won't make me, you know? Mm. Wow. Okay. But their government was also going to pay pretty hefty. Yeah. So they, I mean, they relocated everyone. So I was- did the math. It was around 250 to 300,000 that they would have gotten at that time. Now in the eighties, so even each person, each person, if, oh. And the government's like, here, take your money and run, honey. So you mean like 200, and that's like, in, not in today's money. Like no. That's like $200,000 in, in 80s money. Oh, yeah. Sh- I mean, yeah, I'll move anywhere. I would, I'll move damn near anywhere. You could have almost got a mansion at that <laughs> I mean, point. You know? Wow, okay. I know. But the Centralia mine not only caused physical destruction, they also unleashed a wave of ghostly tales and urban legends. Ooh, I want to hear it. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about the urban legends and ghost stories of Centralia, Pennsylvania. Locals and visitors alike have reported eerie accounts and the unexplained phenomena in the abandoned town. One of the famous stories that's mostly told is called the Seven Gates to Hell, a series of mysterious gateways that are said to lead to the underworld. People who visit the town often say that they leave with an extremely heavy and dark impression on their soul. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Famous ghost sightings in Centralia are kind of stated with over the years, numerous ghost sightings being reported have fueled this reputation that it's now a haunted town. Witnesses claim to have seen apparitions of coal miners, children playing in the streets, even a ghostly woman wandering throughout abandoned buildings. These sightings have added to the allure and intriguing surroundings that Centralia paranormal activity have to offer. I definitely can see the coal miner. I mean, like that tracks from the 111 yeah. deaths. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, a personal account of one man named Scott Saylor of New Jersey wrote on one of his online blog forums of one of his eerie encounters visiting Centralia. So he quotes, I visited Centralia last weekend with a couple of friends, and I thought I might share a very weird experience I had while exploring the town. We were there for around an hour and a half, and we were checking out the interesting locations that I heard about, like the burning hillside, the crack in Route 61, the streets without homes. While we were there in the area next to the old cemetery on the east side of the town, east of Route 61, we had just checked out of the old tombstones area when we were getting a whiff of smoke from the east of that section. So we walked down the old gravel road to look around. We found a slag covered hillside with steam coming out of it. And we were pretty fascinated by some fossils we found. When we heard what sounded like a voice saying something inaudible from down below where we were, all three of us heard it. We looked at each other. We figured it was someone else checking out the area too. So we kind of just ignored it. Then we heard it again a little more clearly. A few words were there and it sounded sort of like leave this place. At that moment, the hill we were standing on started steaming more than a few moments before. And it really stunk like rotting eggs, which I'm assuming is sulfur. Well, it sort of spooked us, as you can imagine. So we figured that we better head back to the car. And as we were walking back in the area of the cemetery, we heard it again. Not the same words, but and they weren't also clear, but it was something like, why? Why did you do that? What was even weirder was that it wasn't like someone was yelling it out of the bushes. It was quiet, kind of like getting closer. So we couldn't really figure out what direction it was coming from. It was super weird. They got back to the car and they didn't see any other cars or people around them the entire time they were there. Because again, the town's abandoned. That was me saying that, not them. We left and we were not sure to make any sense of this. And we really were not sure that we wanted to continue to talk about it. All I know is I'm not going back. When I got home, I found out that the area where we were walking and where near that location was where the fire actually started across from the cemetery. They just thought they'd let you know. And there was something not right about that place. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm in a town and I'm hearing disembodied voices speaking to me, I'm I'm getting the fuck out of there. I might not go back. I might not go back either. The fuck out of there is what I'm doing. I might not go back. (laughs) <laughs> Another terrifying tale from a firsthand experience comes from Jim and his girlfriend, Lori, who emailed the story back in 1999. Hi, my name is Jim. About a month ago, my girlfriend, Lori, and I were coming back from Cobles, and we decided to take 61 home and stop at Centralia to take a look as we once did before. Let me first say we're not superstitious. In fact, we're quite the opposite. We like checking out abandoned 
places and old buildings, old cemeteries, that sort of thing. We've seen a lot of old abandoned homes over the years, but the one that we checked out in Centralia about a month ago really gave us a fright. It was a white abandoned twin home up on a side street on a hill. There were two units and both had red numbers sprayed on the front, which indicated from what I gathered in the homes were probably set to be demolished in the near future. So we decided to check it out. The back door was open. So we went in. The sum of the first windows on the first floor were boarded up, making it extremely dark, but we explored the house a little. When we were on the second floor in the hallway, near the stairs that led up and down to the first and third floor, the door was open, leading up to the third floor. Lori was in the hallway while I was at the top of the steps that led downstairs. At that point, we heard footsteps coming down from the stairs from the third floor. It sounded to me like the steps were coming down from the ceiling above the steps going down to the first floor. So my first thought was someone was coming down from the attic or the third floor bedroom. At first, we were startled and thought someone else was in the home. As the footsteps sounded like they were about to reach the second floor hallway, Lori looked into the stairwell expecting to see someone. And of course, there was no one there. Nope. At the same time, I looked down the steps to the first floor and also saw nobody there. We just stared at each other for a few seconds. I said, want to leave? And she said, yeah. Yeah. We made a beeline (laughs) down to the back door where we came out to our car. We drove about 100 feet and stopped, looked back at the house, looking at the windows. I mean, we expected to see someone looking at us. Nothing, though. Really weird. Like someone to walk down those stairs, but we couldn't see them. It freaked us the hell out. Anyways, I don't know what to make of it. You know who used to live in that house? Well, we're not even sure who it was, what numbers were there. But if I ever thought a house was haunted, it was going to be that one. This sort of changed my impression on old vacant homes. Wow. Yeah. So these are two people who don't even believe in this. And Correct. Then, yeah. So. And now they're like, oh, ghosts are things. Yeah, that's going to be a no. Absolutely. <laughs> so a little bit more about the abandoned town and the eerie atmosphere. Today, Centralia stands out as a ghost town with its deserted streets, crumbling buildings, and it's serving as a haunted reminder of the tragic past. The once thriving community is now a desolate landscape, blanketed in a shroud of silence. The absence of life, the decaying structures, all of this surrounding it create an eerie atmosphere that is hard to ignore. For those that are brave enough to venture into Centralia, a unique and spine-chilling experience will await you. Exploring the abandoned town allows visitors to immerse themselves in its haunted history and witness the remains of a community consumed by fire. However, it is important to exercise caution and respect the area's restricted zones for safety reasons. I mean, you don't want to be sucked into a burning (laughs) pit of hell. A burning sinkhole or whatever. (laughs) Safety concerns and legal restrictions. While Centralia may be fascinating and it's a destination for paranormal enthusiasts and history buffs from all over the world, it's crucial to be aware of the safety concerns and legal restrictions in place. The underground mine fire continues to burn to this day, releasing toxic gases and unstable ground, which poses risk for sinkholes. So visitors should adhere to the guidelines set by local authorities and avoid trespassing on private property to avoid yourself getting sucked in not like Todd. to Hades' lair. Just let me tell you, Cousin Eric is not there to save everybody. <laughs> he ain't going to be there for you in that tree room, honey. <laughs> Centralia's haunted history and paranormal activity have not gone unnoticed by popular culture. The town has actually been inspired by, um, it's inspired numerous books, movies, and documentaries, further perpetuating its mystique and awesome history for enthusiasts from all over. From horror novels to video games, Centralia has become a symbol of eerie fascination, captivating audiences around the world. Centralia, Pennsylvania remains a place of intrigue with its haunted past, unexplained phenomenon, and it's continuing to captivate the imagination of everyone from everywhere. The combination of the coal mine fire and the reported ghostly experiences has made Centralia a unique destination for those seeking a spine-chilling adventure experience. However, like we said before, it's essential to approach the town with respect and awareness as the troubled history and ongoing safety concerns cannot be forgotten. By delving into the history of Centralia, exploring the haunting ghost stories, examining the impact it had on popular culture, we've uncovered the enduring mystery of the eerie town. Centralia's reputation as a hotbed of paranormal activity continues to draw in curious visitors despite the deserted streets and abandoned buildings still staying. Whether you're a believer in supernatural or simply fascinated by the mysteries of the past, a visit to Centralia is sure to leave you with a lasting impression, especially on your soul. 
I mean... Just remember to tread carefully, though, as the whispers of the past echo through the present in this haunting destination like no other. Ooh, would you go? Ah, you know, I'm, I'm an enthusiast to the max. Like, I kind of want to... I, 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 I know. I mean, it'd be during the day, number one, obviously. But what if you get stuck and you're stuck at night in the fiery pit of hell, which I is in Trollio? Hmm, I don't know. Have you seen Silent Hill? Yeah. So that's inspired from this town. Okay. Okay. And if you remember correctly, and I don't know if this would happen to you, but the mom, for those of you that haven't seen it, spoiler alert, the mom ends up going through this town and she's dead the whole time because of her breathing all these toxic fumes in and she's passed out. But she thinks she's alive and trying to help find her daughter through this community when really she's been dead the whole time. Mm -hmm. So it kind of serves as a limbo between yeah. those living and those not. All right. Well, really amazing story. I Thank enjoyed you. that one. That was yes. really a great one to do research on and tell all of you great people out there listening to this great podcast. Yeah. Boop, boop. So, Renee, yes. you are up, friend. I am, and I'm going to be telling everybody today about the horrible murder of a young girl named Junko Furuta. Okay. Um, it's based out of Japan. So. You really enjoy picking stories with names we can't pronounce very well. You know, I don't know why I'm doing this to myself. I do but, it to myself, you know, too. Here we are. Here so. we are. <laughs> Junko Furuta was born on January 18th, 1971 in Masato, Japan. She lived with her parents and had an older brother and a younger brother. Not very much is known about her life, but by all accounts, her home life was happy. Junko was an excellent student and very well liked by her classmates. She also had aspirations of becoming a singer. She was very driven. She worked as a plastic mold factory employee but had recently accepted a position as an electronics retail worker where she had planned on working after graduation. Oh, so she was trying different things out. And... Yes. Okay. So she's 17 at the time of um, when this happened. Okay. On November 25th, 1988, Junko was riding her bicycle home from work when she was approached by Shin Shinji Minato, a 16 year old boy under the orders of an 18 year old named Hiroshi Miyanu. Minato kicked Junko off of her bike and fled the scene. Miyano then pretended to witness the attack by coincidence and offered to walk her home safely. So that's shady. Sounds gross. plain to me. Mm -hmm. He gained her trust, which allowed him to trick her into going into a warehouse with him, where he threatened to kill her. He raped her in the warehouse and then again in a nearby hotel. Disgusting. Yeah. He then called Minato and two other friends that they had been getting into trouble and committing crimes with and bragged about what he had done. The other two boys were named Joe Agura and Yasushi Watanabe, who were both 17 years old. They begged Miyano to keep Junko captive so that they could all take turns raping her. Terrible. Which is disgusting. Gross, man. This group had previously kidnapped and assaulted another girl, but had released her. She never reported it because of the boy's connection to the Yazuka, which is essentially the Japanese mafia. Yeah. And she was afraid that something terrible would happen to her and her entire family. And that's kind of, it seemed like um, a lot of times with people, if they had connections to the Yazuka, they can kind of do it, like kind of whatever they want. Because people are so afraid of the repercussions of, you know, going against them that they'll just keep quiet forever. Oh, so. mm -hmm. scary. The boys took Junko to Minato's home where he lived with his parents. At first, they were able to convince his parents that Junko was his girlfriend. But once they realized that his parents weren't going to contact the police regardless of what they did to her, they didn't even bother keeping up the act anymore. It was later discovered that his parents knew exactly what was going on, but that they were afraid of their son and his ties to the Yakuza. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> this is going to get bad. So oh. they held Junko captive for over 40 days. She was continuously raped, beaten and tortured by the boys who were fueled by sadistic desires and a thirst for power. They would even invite other men and boys to the home to participate in the horror. Are you fucking kidding me? Mm. Oh my God. 
Junko's parents had filed a missing person report, but the police failed to find her, despite the fact that she was only being held just three blocks away from her home. The investigation was also deterred because they forced Junko to contact her parents on three separate occasions to try and convince them that she had simply ran away and was safe staying with friends. Oh, man. (sighs) During her captivity... Junko was subjected to unimaginable and unspeakable acts of violence. She was raped daily, once by 12 different men on the same day. In total, it was estimated that she was assaulted by around 100 different men over 400 times. Oh my fucking God, this is awful. Mm -hmm. They got off on humiliating her. For example, she was forced to dance naked and masturbate in front of them while they hung out and listened to music. (sighs) She was forced to sleep outside on the balcony in the cold winter with very little clothing and sometimes also forced to sleep in the freezer. What? This was December and it's cold in Japan. So, yeah. Oh, no. They inserted they inserted objects into her body, including a metal rod, a bottle and even a lit match. I would probably kill myself. (sighs) It's it's horrible. She was beaten constantly to the point where she was unable to move. It got to the point where she was so sick and injured that she couldn't even keep water down anymore. She would throw it up instantly. She was forced to smoke multiple cigarettes at once and inhale paint thinner. What? They would repeatedly pour lighter fluid on her arms and legs and light her on fire. She was forced to eat live cockroaches and drink her own urine. She was suspended from the ceiling and treated like a punching bag. I can't even believe this. Yeah. By the end of December, she was so weak and unable to move because of her horrible injuries that she could not even leave the bedroom and had lost all control of her bladder and bowels. She begged and begged for them just to kill her, but they refused. So basically, this is going on for over 40 days. Um... It's just, it's terrible. There's a, there's a lot more details of things that happen that I have chosen not to include in our story. I mean, you're more than welcome to, to find that out on yourself, but um, I had to take several breaks actually writing this. And, month, and if so. you do want those sources, they'll, they'll be definitely yes. more details in the show notes. So. <clears throat> on January 4th, 1989, Miano lost a game of Mahjong and became so enraged that he decided to take his anger out on Junko. He began pouring lighter fluid on her and lighting her on fire. The boys all joined in and began beating and kicking her. They lit a candle and poured the hot wax on her face. She was forced again to drink her own urine. She was bleeding heavily, but they continued to beat her, along with dropping an iron exercise ball onto her multiple times. This final attack lasted around two hours before Junko ultimately passed away, which is... I mean, I, at, I, at this point, you know, like, good. Normally I, I have know, a lot of I mean, commentary, but... I, uh, there, there really isn't words. I know. Ah, uh, this is just... It's bad. Wow. Um, yeah. They then wrapped her body in blankets and placed her into a 55-gallon drum and filled it up with cement. They disposed of it in a cement truck in Tokyo. Now, on January 23rd, 1989, Miano and Ogura were arrested in connection to a gang rape of a 19-year-old woman whom they had kidnapped back in December, but had let go. On March 29th, while being interrogated because women's underwear had been found at their residence during the searches, Miano inexplicably confessed to the murder of Junko and told police where they could find her body. Just like, just... I, I mean, I guess there's got to be guilt there, you know? Well, it's, if they're part of a gang, so is terrible. there, though? I mean, how? Mm. I don't know. Like, how can you feel guilt at all after everything you did? Yeah. Well, apparently he had believed that they were aware of his culpability in Junko's murder and that O'Gara must have confessed. The police were initially very confused because they had actually been interrogating him about a completely different murder investigation. The following day, police found the drum containing Junko. All four boys were arrested for the murder of Junko Fruta, as well as several other accomplices who were identified in the rape and abuse. Insane. Due to juvenile laws in Japan at the time, they were only sentenced to extremely short prison terms, especially given how heinous the crimes were. 
Back then, any anyone under twenty was considered a minor in Japan. Am I about to be pissed off? You're going to be really. I'm. Everyone's going to be really furious oh, right no. now. So really, I don't, really I don't furious. Like being pissed off. Hmm. Man. Okay, go ahead. Shinji Minato received five to seven years. Whoa. Hmm. Okay. All right. Joe Agura. Eight years. Mm. Yasushi Watanabe received nine years. And Hiroshi Miyano actually did receive 17 years. And it was later changed at 20 after an appeal. But still, 20 years, which was the maximum that he could have even been. And how old was that one when we started? 18. Oh, my God. So I think that's why he was given. He was definitely like the ringleader. um, But... It's, it's just, yeah. Wow. This obviously sparked public outrage and did end up leading to a change in the Japanese legal system, as well as a conversation about the treatment of juvenile offenders. Junko's murder shook the entire nation of Japan and the world. Her story serves as a reminder of the extreme cruelty and depravity that some individual... Oh, wow. Into vegetables? <laughs> <laughs> I'm into vegetables. <laughs> Thank you. That some individuals are capable of. <laughs> and the importance of justice and protection for victims of such heinous crimes. Her memory lives on as a symbol of strength and resilience in the face of unimaginable suffering. And her story continues to raise awareness about the prevalence of violence against women and the need for stricter punishment for perpetrators of such crimes. And that is the terrible fucking story of the murder of Junko Furuta and those fucking asshole boys. You know, as a true crime enthusiast, I have heard a lot and seen a lot of fucked up shit on TV and podcasts. Yeah, this one shook me a little bit. This one actually leaves me me with a feeling of um, almost like my soul left my body. I'm a little, I'm sorry for that. Uh, That was, that was rough. That was a tough one to deal with. However, in terms of picking a great, moving, fucked up story, A plus for you. Thank you. Thank you. My sources for today's article on the haunting of the abandoned town, Centralia, Pennsylvania. I have two Wikipedia articles on the fire, on the mine disaster, and Centralia itself. The Centralia, Pennsylvania YouTube video and Offroad's article on Centralia, Pennsylvania. My sources for Junko Furuta's murder are a medium.com article, the Wikipedia article, people.howstuffworks, and I did listen to a serial killing a podcast. Yes, you did. Yes, I did. I always like to incorporate a podcast. It helps me. You know, I might actually try that because I'm going to be doing a lot of driving lately. So I'm going to need to get that on the road and help me with... The journey of telling stories to all you great people out there. Yes. And you know what, Josh? What, Renee? Mystery never sleeps. It never does. And neither do we. Bye. Bye. Humor, haunts, and homicide.